please switch off all your cell phones. Or at least put it on silent. And then, also I have a couple of additional purposes. So you may just leave on that in here. And if you have space for significant, not in my room, I'll start off with the tracker purpose. Put your little power tracker book, the RS3 book. Daar is het allemaal een hele grote praktische complet. Als daar van ons volwassen vrienden is, alsjeblieft, dan is het eerst denken. Begin maar eens een tijd op als het mogelijk is. Dat is vast, alsjeblieft, dat kan dan ten aanzien. Goed, dan is het eerder ons kunnen veel langer wachten. We hebben de laatste paar nog zoek voor de plekje. Baie welkom aan allemaal. Ik ga nu eerst van die verrukte in Engels doen. En omdat onze groep van Engelse gasten hier nu vanaf, ik wil dit eerst een bedankt in doen. Marashi en Christy, dat is die mentorvereniging, en dat het geheel om jullie hele communiteit te reel gaan. En aan die einde, professor Lennox had genoeg tijd hier voor vraag, maar aan die einde, daar zal zeker een mens die dus een opvraag over vraag. En Marashi en Christy, die hele komt mens uit Amerika uit te brengen, wat baie gekwalificeerd is om die type vraag te beantwoord wat die moet ik zal leggen. En dat is al naar die tijd waar die punt nie daar is in voorjaars. So as jy nie gewend het kry om die vraag te vraag nie, het naar die tijd in voorjaars te leef. So, good evening ladies and gentlemen, this is Moesh Dess. Thank you very much for attending this occasion. My name is Thomas van Holt, and I will be your master of ceremonies tonight. Firstly, I request Professor Henk Snooker from the Faculty of Theology of the Northwest University to please open the proceedings for scripture and prayer. Professor Snooker, please. Psalm 8 Jere ons Jere, hoe wonderbaar is die naam oor die hele aarde. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Die het om met aansien en eer gekroon, You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You have put everything under his feet. What a wonder that was a skipper made. What we can tell from someone with unbelievable understanding that even us best think, but not stick his own hand on the deck. But someone who has an unbelievable love for the Prague, the wonder that we can be skipper made. Kom ons dit saam net as vry. Emily Father, we so thank you for tonight and we thank you that we can be together and and that we can celebrate the things that you have made. Ons dank hier dat u ons ook gewend het vir om vraag te vraag. Tot aan die kruis vraag u ons Heere Jesus, waarom het u my verlaag? En ons dank hier dat ons enige tijd waar enige iets mag vraag vraag. And we pray that tonight you will give us answers about a lot of things, but that you also will help us to think further about what you aim for us to do and the difference that we can make on this earth. We pray that you will be with Professor Lennox and we thank you for the insights and the gifts that you have gave him. In the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much, Professor Snooker. Ladies and gentlemen, before I ask Professor Fricky van Nieke to formally introduce Professor Lennox to you, I wish to briefly present the context of this evening's presentation. At our university, we believe that students should be equipped with more than mere academic knowledge and skills. And therefore, all undergraduate students attend a compulsory module entitled Understanding the World. Now to understand the world is easier said than done, because it is a complex and confusing place. Rapid, mind-boggling scientific and technological developments, together with numerous confusing statements about the relationship between science and religion, and specifically the position and authority of the Bible, make it very difficult to develop a mindset 
with which the world can be fully understood. Sometimes we ask ourselves, what is the relationship between faith and science? What should the position and status of the Bible be in scientific paradigms? Is it possible to simultaneously be a believing Christian and a scientist? Such questions are not easy to answer. Some scientists see the hand of God in creation, while others come to the conclusion that the concept of a God is superfluous. In the field of theology, it is just as confusing. Some theologians propagate the fundamentalistic use of the Bible that leads to scientific ideas, such as young earth creationism, where people come to the conclusion that the earth is only about 7,000 years old, based on the literal interpretation of biblical information. This interpretation differs from that of others who, on the basis of empirical data, conclude that the earth is some four and a half billion years old. To further complicate this matter, other theologians today doubt the authority of the Bible. And here I refer specifically to the so-called new reformers, who claim that the Bible is not the inspired word of God, with the inherent indication that human life is solely a product of chance, with no higher purpose. So when we learned that Professor John Lennox would come to South Africa, we requested him to pay us a visit here in Rochester and to share with us his ideas on some of these issues. It is therefore with great pleasure that I now invite Professor Fricky van Nieker, the Institutional Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the Northwest University, to formally introduce and welcome Professor John Lennox. Professor van Nieker, please. <laughs> Uh, Professor Van der Waal, Professor Lennox, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is a great privilege and honor to welcome Professor Jim John Lennox at this university. And it is especially wonderful if one senses the atmosphere and the spirit in this hall tonight. It is an absolute delight to, to, to see and to sense the vibrance and the anticipation and the joy that is so clearly here with you tonight. Professor Lemos, I would like to welcome you on behalf of Dr. Tienzel Lund, the Vice Chancellor, on behalf of the University Management Institution, as well as all three campuses, on behalf of the academic community, on behalf of each student sitting here tonight, and also members of the public. We are very proud to have an eminent scholar in our midst. But it is even more heartening to have you here because I believe what you stand for resonates deeply with what this institution stands for. I explained this afternoon that the roots of one of the constituent partners of the North East University, the former Kostestrum University for Christian Higher Education, and the roots go back to 16. To, to 19, uh, sorry, 1869 in the town of Douglas Dorp in the Northern Cape. And we were from upon for many years for having had that surname, Christian Higher Education. And given the pressure of the time and the new political dispensation and the fact that we are a neutral, and not a neutral, but a, a general uh, public entity, we have now said that maybe this even though the surname may have vanished from buildings, we trust that more than ever, the true meaning of Christian higher education would be in our hearts and would be evident in how we live and work with each other and would be evident in the way that we are trustees of a wonderful, wonderful opportunity or sets of opportunities that our dear Lord has so generously bestowed upon us. A wonderful opportunity to listen, to sit at your feet, to learn from you, and to make you part of us. We trust that you will always think of us uh, as a warm university who has expressed in public our absolute desire to see you back here. Thank you so much. I would just like to introduce you, sir, if you will give me a few minutes. Professor John Lennox is Professor of Mathematics at the University of Oxford. He is Fellow in Mathematics and the Philosophy of Science 
and postural advice at Green Templeton, Templeton College, Oxford. He is also an adjunct lecturer at Whitehall Hall, Oxford University, and at the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics, and he is a senior fellow of the Trinity Forum. In addition, he teaches for the Oxford Strategic Leadership Program at the Executive Education Centre, State Business School, that is also at Oxford University. He studied at the Royal School of Parma, um, Northern Ireland, and was exhibitioner and senior scholar at Emmanuel College, Cambridge University, from which he took his MA and PhD. He worked for many years at the Mathematics Institute at the University of Wales in Cardiff, which awarded him a DSc for his research. He also holds a DPhil from Oxford University and an MA in Bioethics from the University of Surrey. He was a senior Alexander von Humboldt Fellow at the University of Würzburg and Freiburg in Germany. In addition to over 70 published mathematical papers, let me say, in mathematics, to publish a paper is quite a big deal. They do not come that easily and that often. So, um, uh, and he is the uh, co-author of two research level texts in algebra in the Oxford Mathematics Monograph series. His most recent book on the interface between science, philosophy, and theology is God's Undertaker. And the title is, excuse me, is God's Undertaker, Has Science Buried God? This is in Oxford, Lionel in 2009. He has lectured extensively in North America, Eastern and Western Europe on mathematics, the philosophy of science, and the intellectual defense of Christianity. He debated Richard Dawkins on the God Delusion at the University of Alabama in 2007 and on Has Science Very God in the Oxford Museum of Natural History in 2008. He has also debated Christopher Hitchens on the New Atheism that was during the Edinburgh Festival in 2008 and in Sanford University, Alabama on the question, Is God Great? I believe today, an evil was released, Gunning for God, an Afrikaans quarterly perceived, and he says it's quite a quite the right title uh, with, with an Irish background in mind, Gunning for God. The last year was published, Seven Days That Divided the World. Uh, John Lennox is married to Sally, they have three grown up children and four grandchildren, and they live in Oxford. If I may just say, I believe more than ever do we have to consider what immense opportunities we have as young scientists, young students, to be trustees, stewards for our Lord and to embrace the opportunities that He has given us. When I was a student, like you, a few years, only a few years ago, <laughs> I recall a lecture given in this very hall. It still reverberates in my mind. The, the title was, in Afrikaans, Verbreed your bases, verdiep your wortels. Plom your base, deepen your roots. And I would just like to read as, as, as a final introduction, someone, bless is the man or woman, who walks not in the council of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his or her delight is in, is in the law of the Lord. And the law of the Lord, I believe for a modern scientist, is also that which you can see, the revelation in nature. And on his law, he mediates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. To the radio glasses, to the pure Thank you. Voll verwacht in klopt ons hart. <laughs> Ik kan geen Afrikaans spreken. 
And so I'm going to address you in English. What a sheer delight it is to see so many students. And I shouldn't tell you this, but this is the biggest audience I've had in South Africa. So congratulations. I've been invited to speak to you about Christianity, science, and the New Atheism. And I want to come straight to the heart of the God-Science debate today. There is a widespread myth that science has always been on a collision course with belief in God. And so therefore the two, the natural sciences and faith in God, are fundamentally incompatible. Indeed, further, it is argued by the new atheists that science leads away from God. It is not neutral, it leads to atheism. So let's explode the myth in a very easy way. Possibly the most significant natural science project of your generation is the decoding of the human genome, the so-called Human Genome Project. Its first director was Jim Watson, who co-won the Nobel Prize with Francis Crick for discovering the double helix structure of DNA. He is an outspoken atheist. The second director of the Human Genome Project is Francis Collins, who is now the director of the National Institute of Health in North America. He is a Christian. Now, that simple fact tells us a great deal, because here are two top scientists. They're working on precisely the same project using exactly the same techniques of analysis. So what divides them is not their science. One an atheist, the other a Christian. What divides them is their worldview. And if ever we're going to understand what's going on in the contemporary academy and in society as a whole, this is the first thing to grasp. There is a conflict. It is not between science and religion. It is much deeper. It is between two diametrically opposed worldviews. Now, there are three major families of worldviews. But because two of them are most prominent and collide in the academy, I'm going to leave pantheism aside for tonight. But if you go back to the ancient Greek world, people were, as you ought to be, fascinated trying to explain the universe. And one of the big questions they ask themselves is, what is ultimate reality? Do the questions go infinitely backwards in time? Or do we come to a stop with ultimate reality? And on the one hand, there were the great atomists, like Democritus and Leucippus, who decided that ultimate reality consisted of two things, the atoms and the void. It was a brilliant insight. Atomos, something that cannot be cut. Of course, we now know that atoms can be divided. But it was such a fascinating insight. And so believing that ultimate reality consisted essentially of mass energy, as we would now say, they believed that this was the explicator of the entire universe. So as the atoms cascaded through the void, they formed galaxies, they formed stars, planets, worlds, life, consciousness, and the idea of God, because there isn't one. So that's the worldview that we call materialism, very closely related and almost indistinguishable from naturalism. It dominates the Western Academy today. But then there were other people in the ancient world like my intellectual hero Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, who said, yes, there is the physical world, but there is more. There is transcendence. And to put it in contemporary terms, to make it simpler, there is God, 
who created the universe and who sustains it. And battling up towards us from the ancient world are these two worldviews. Now at a university like this, you are forming your worldview. It's one of the most important things that happens to you. And I was delighted to hear about the course that you all have to do to increase your capacity to think. Because it is a marvelous opportunity in a university with all its cultural diversity, philosophical, religious diversity, to explore other people's worldviews and to gradually form what your answer is to these very big questions. So what we're facing are two worldviews that are diametrically opposed and coming back to the Human Genome Project. Jim Watson represents the materialistic worldview, and Francis Collins represents the theistic worldview as a Christian. So the real question for a scientist like me is this, not do science and religion cancel each other, because that's self-evidently not so, but the deeper question, where does science sit in relation to those two worldviews? Is it so, as Richard Dawkins argues, that you could take a direct trajectory out of biology into atheism? Or is that not the case? So if you imagine in your mind a big circle over here that represents the materialist view, a big circle over there that represents the theistic worldview, and a little circle in the middle that for the moment will represent natural science, you ask yourself, where do the implications lead? Is natural science neutral? Or does it point towards materialism? Or does it point towards theism? And of course we can only establish any kind of answer to that by considering the evidence. And that's what I propose to do. To give you some of the notions which weigh with me as I consider this matter. Now, the evidence has come from different sources. Firstly, from the history of science. Secondly, from the philosophy and methodology of science. And thirdly, from the results of science. We'll probably not talk much about the results of science tonight. But history is always a great way of contextualizing anything. Indeed, your identity is built up of your concept of your own history. That is why history is immensely important on the large scale. That's why there's such fascination with the history of the universe. Because we have a vested interest in understanding it because it gives us a concept of our identity. It really matters. If the ultimate reality is mass energy and we are essentially a chance phenomenon, or if the ultimate reality is a transcendent personal God, and we are made in his image. There's a vast difference that implicates our situation right here today. So let's look a, a little bit at the history of science. Now modern science sprung up in the 16th and 17th centuries in Western Europe. It was an explosive rise, very rapid indeed. Alfred North Whitehead made the point that in 1500, Europe knew less than Archimedes, who died in 212 BC. And yet, by the year 1700, Newton's Principia Mathematica, the most brilliant book in the history of science, had been written. And North Whitehead wrestled with why did that happen? What was the motor that drove the rise of science? Listen to North Whitehead. It must come from the medieval insistence of the rationality of God, conceived as with the personal energy of Jehovah and the rationality of a Greek philosopher, the impress of the European mind arising from the unquestioned faith of centuries. C.S. Lewis, and some of you may have heard, a great literary genius who actually was in Cambridge when I turned up in 1962, not 1862. <laughs> and I used to listen to him. Because, ladies and gentlemen, although I'm a natural scientist, I don't make the mistake that science is coextensive with rationality. 
Indeed, that's obviously false, because otherwise you'd have to shut half the faculties of this university. <laughs> but it is very important in an age where science is claiming authority to realize it's not coextensive with rationality. And we have a great deal to learn from history, philosophy, art, music, literature. And so although I have a public formal education in the sciences, I'm delighted to have worked all my life with a brilliant classicist who's given me insight into the nature of literature and into the philosophies of the Greco Roman world. So back to the rise of science. C.S. Lewis put it this way. Men became scientific because they expected law in nature and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. That's quite staggering. And we easily forget it. You see, ladies and gentlemen, one of the reasons I'm not embarrassed to be a scientist and a Christian is that Christianity gave me my subject. Now, we can investigate why it was the concepts of a creator and the notion of contingency that gave rise to these ideas. But let me just say in the opposite direction, in case you argue as Dawkins did with me and said, well, everybody was a believer in God in those days, so uh, what's the big surprise? But you see, people have tried to argue the case in the opposite direction. Why, for instance, did science in the modern sense not develop in China? Technology developed, printing, fireworks, and so on. But science didn't develop in China. And Joseph Needham, who was a brilliant chemist at Oxford and also a world expert on China, tried for years to solve that question. He was a neo-Marxist. And in the end, he came to this conclusion. He said the reason that science in the contemporary sense did not arise in China was that they lacked the unifying concept of a single creator who created the universe according to rational law. So it works in both directions. So we look back and we see Galileo, Kepler, Newton, Clark Maxwell, Babbage and so on, all believers in God. And of course it strikes you instantly. How can people like Richard Dawkins suggest that being a believer in God hinders you science? When believing in God catapulted the greatest scientists that have ever been into doing their work. And we need to analyze that carefully. Because there are endless confusions in this whole debate. And I would love to try at least to open your thinking by sorting out some of them. So let's use Newton as an example. When Newton discovered his law of gravitation. He did not say, oh, wonderful, I now know how it works, I don't need God. No, what did he do? He wrote the Principia Mathematica. Brilliant analysis, and he expressed in it the hope that the thinking man, by studying it, might come to believe in the deity. This is immensely important. You see, the more that Newton understood of the intricacies of the universe and its laws, the more he admired the genius of the God who'd done it that way, not the less. That's how it works. If you study engineering here, you are a better position than me to admire the workings of a modern German motor car like a Rolls Royce. <laughs> You're still awake, obviously. If you have studied art here, you're in a position to analyze much better than I can the intricacies of a Picasso or a Rembrandt. In other words, the more you understand it, the more you admire the genius of life behind it. You don't say, because I understand at this level, there is no intelligence behind it. It's the exact opposite. Newton didn't make that mistake. Now, why is it that Dawkins makes that mistake, Hitchens made that mistake, and so many other people made that mistake. Well, there are several reasons why they think this. And let me go to the first confusion. It has to do with the nature of explanation. 
This is an immensely important topic for young scientists, but especially for everybody. What does it mean to explain something? Because we constantly hear, science explains. Well, think about it. The law of gravitation, does that explain gravity? No. And you can realize it. What it does is tell you how to do certain calculations on the basis of knowing what happens when massive bodies attract one another. But what it does not tell you is what gravity is. Do you realize that no one knows what gravity is? I wish they taught me that at school. <laughs> no one knows what energy is. And we've all sorts of laws dominating these things, but the laws do not explain. They're very powerful. They help us to do intricate mathematics, but they only open up the topic at a certain level. And it was Wittgenstein who very perceptively observed the greatest deception of the modern era is that the laws of nature are explanations of the phenomena of nature. The greatest deception, he said, of modernism is that the laws of nature are explanations of the phenomena of nature. They're not. So I'm passionate about science, but we do science no service if we misunderstand what its concept of explanation is. That's number one. It limits it. Two. Explanations are of different kinds. Newton didn't deny the existence of God when he discovered his law of gravity for a very simple reason. He was capable of making the distinction between mechanism and law on the one hand and agency on the other hand. Now, I find it rather amusing. I was at the school the other day in Cape Town, explaining this to the boys. And I find that kids of 12 to 17 can understand this more easily than Richard Dawkins. I don't know what that tells me. <laughs> but I said to them, let's imagine we've got a Ford Galaxy motor car sitting here. And I open up the bonnet and you see the engine. And I say, look, what would we mean by explaining this engine? And an engineer puts his hand up and says, well, you know, that engine, it's there because of the laws of internal combustion and some very clever engineering. And somebody else puts her hand up and says, that's utter nonsense, it's there because of Henry Ford. <laughs> well, I'm glad you laugh, it shows me that you see the point. Does the explanation in terms of Henry Ford compete with the explanation in terms of the law of internal combustion? Of course not. Does it conflict with the explanation in terms of the law of internal combustion? Does knowing that the car originally was invented by Henry Ford stop you doing research in internal combustion and engineering? No. And yet the myth prevails that once you've got a law mechanism explanation, that, by definition, excludes the person agency. That is logical nonsense. And very foolish and dangerous nonsense. Let me put it this way. The existence of a law stroke mechanism that does something is not in itself evidence against the existence of a personal agent who designed both the law and the mechanism. They're in different categories. So Newton was free to do his science, rather than saying with Dawkins, if you believe in God, that's a science stopper. We'll come to that in a moment. So what's this major point here? It's firstly, the nature of explanation is more limited than you think. Secondly, it's that there are different levels of explanation, and there are more actually that I have mentioned if you read, read any philosophical book on the nature of science. But I simply restrict myself to the question of mechanism and agency. These are very simple things, but they're very important ideas. Now, let me come to the next confusion. You see, when people argue that you must choose 
between God and science, which essentially is the cry today. And Stephen Hawking has joined the bandwagon with his book with Leonard Mlodinoff, The Grand Design. And it puts a lot of people I meet, not only students at university, but professors, under pressure. Because what they're told is, if you want to remain intellectually respectable, you've got to give up this notion of God. And you've got to go with science. Indeed, it reminds me of a little story when I was your age, as I look at you. I suspect many of you are 19. And in Cambridge at 19, I was taken aside by a Nobel Prize winner. I'd never met one before. And he invited me, plus four professors, no other students, to his room. And he sat me down and said, Lennox, do you want a career in science? I said, yes, sir. Well, he said, the first thing you do is give up these childish notions of God. They will cripple you. They will hold you back. And I was a bit cocky in those days. So I said, sir, what have you got to offer me better than what I've got? <laughs> and he came out with, to my amazement, some very outdated philosophy of Bergsonianism. And when he had explained it badly to me, I uh, said, well, sir, I'm going to stick with what I have. But the pressure was enormous, ladies and gentlemen. I was 19, he just won the Nobel Prize. And that's the pressure, God or science. Dawkins says it, Hawking says it, so it's got to be right. But half a minute. What we need to ask is what most people have not noticed. The problem does not simply lie in their concept of science. It lies in their concept of God. You see, it's very easy to assume when Richard Dawkins says, I believe that God doesn't exist, I want to know what God he doesn't believe in. Because this is immensely important, because I discovered the following. Hawking, Dawkins, Singer, Steiner, Sherman, all the rest of them, they believe that I believe in a God of the gaps. That is, I can't explain it, never God did it. The ancient Greeks thought that lightning was and thunder were the anger of the gods. But do a bit of atmospheric physics, please, and punch us through, and you know that it's all got to do with electrical discharges, air pressure, movement, and so on. It's just God. You don't need God for that little gap. So let's turn to another gap where we think God is working. They think we believe in the God of the gaps. I don't believe in a God of the gaps. I've never met a serious theist who does. I believe in a God of the whole show. <laughs> but you see, now here's the rub of this. Try and follow me. If you think that God is simply a placeholder to be gradually edged out with every new scientific discovery, by definition you must choose between God and science. Because you define God that way. Now that is the thing that I stumbled upon in the last few years. And it was so enlightening to me. That the problem these people had with me was. Not so much a misunderstanding of science. Although there was plenty of that. It's a misunderstanding of the nature of God. I believe God is a God of the things we don't understand. And of the things we do. And you see back to Newton. He saw this. So the more science he understood, he didn't dismiss God because his God was not a God of the gaps. He said, what a marvelous God who did it this way. Now this clears the path for us to come back to a very different concept of God. And if my experience is anything to go by, it is very difficult to get it across. Now at this point, you will meet as I have met publicly, privately, an objection. Again about explanation. Dawkins said to me publicly, he said, look, if you bring in God at any level as an explanation, that's nonsensical. Because what you're using God to do is to explain something less complex than himself. 
God is by definition an extremely complex being. So if you bring in God at any level to explain the universe as an agent, it's no sense. Well, maybe, but I put it to Richard Dawkins that I discovered a book called The God Delusion. And I discovered it was moderately complex. And um, I thought I'd ask about its origin, of its complexity. And I discovered it originated in the mind of Richard Dawkins, which is infinitely more complex than the book. So I missed, <laughs> so I missed this sad explanation, and I'm still looking for a naturalistic one. <laughs> this is childish argument. This is intellectual triviality, which is why serious thinkers on the continent, atheists included many of them, Dismiss it utterly and laugh at it. It is absurd. But there's a deeper issue. Because we have been taught to think that explanation always is from the simple to the complex. Why would you believe that? Well, I'll tell you why you would have to believe it. You would have to believe it if you are a materialist. Like God. Because there's no other option. See, think about it. If there is no transcendence, if there is no God, all you've got is mass energy. So everything you see, including yourself, has got to be explicable reductionistically in terms of mass and energy. Which is why he says, I want to explain everything, like elephants, solely in terms of physics and chemistry. That's what we mean by reductionism. Now, reductionism is another sophisticated notion. And it's a very important idea we use in science. We, all the time, all of us and all of you, are methodological reductionists. If you're faced with a big problem by your uh, science uh, professor, you will probably break it into smaller problems and say, I can get insight at that, at that, and that, and I put them together. Ah, I've got it. I see how the whole thing fits. In other words, you study bits of it, put it together, and get insight onto the whole. That's methodological reduction, a very powerful tool. But what we're talking about here is ontological reductionism. From the Greek word ontos, meaning being, that everything must be ultimately reducible to physics and chemistry. If you believe that, you have no option, you see. You have no choice. You are stuck. You've got to be able to do it that way. Incidentally, I might just say, because I'm bound to get in the questions, and I might as well deal with it, because I get asked it so much. The very heart of the God delusion argument is related to that God is more complex than the thing you're explaining notion. It's, if you believe that God created the universe, then if you've any kind of logic in you, you will have to ask the question, who created God? And then if you've any more logic in you, you'll ask, who created the God that created the God that created the God? And you can't go backwards forever, so the whole thing's nonsense, so let's go away and play football. <laughs> well now, I know there are philosophers here. And this is, comes from a misunderstanding of the ontological argument and the cosmological argument more in particular. But I'm not going to go into that tonight. Let me just keep it at a level that's accessible to all of us. Who created the creator? I love, you see, I'm a pure mathematician. I hope you love logical analysis. There's nothing like it. I learned it from Euclid, you know. I hope they teach Euclid these days geometry and axioms and the logic of building up. Now let's use a bit of logic on this. Who created the creator? Let me remove the word creator. Who created X? That's a question. But now it's an interesting question. What assumptions does it force on the dialogue? Well, if you say who created X, you're assuming X was created, aren't you? By definition. So, if you say who created the creator, you're assuming the creator was created. What if he wasn't? 
If Richard Dawkins' book was called The Created God's Delusion, I don't think I'd have bought it. Because I don't intend to tell me created gods are delusion. We usually call them idols. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the philosopher has a, have a word for this. It's called a complex question. It shuts down a range of possibilities, but you don't notice that. Ah, but there's a thing. You see, no Christian, Jew or Muslim, believes in a created creator. One of the bases or centers of the Christian um, doctrine is that God is uncreated and uncaused. So I said to Richard Dawkins, let's just pursue this a little bit more. If you believe this is a valid question, what it certainly is about created God, so let me ask you, you believe the universe created you. Who created your creator? Still waiting for an answer. <laughs> Do you see the point? It's got a sting. When these questions come up, always try to reverse them or invert them and see what they actually imply. It's a non question, you see. And it doesn't attack at all the fundamental of is there an uncreated deity? And yet Dawkins has made that the key argument of his whole book. I find that utterly astonishing. But now, and I want to give you a half hour to ask questions, I want to come to two more things very briefly. First of all, a big topic in itself. People will say, look here, this is no good. And in fact, I was with Dawkins again, but nobody knows that, on television in America just recently for a whole hour on the Charlie Rose Show. Charlie Rose is a moderator of debates between presidential candidates. But Richard Dawkins and I had a, an hour with uh, one another, and he um, really well, he came out of his corner like a boxer attacking me and essentially saying something like this. I hope I don't misrepresent him because I haven't seen the tape, but something like this. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Professor Levitt from Oxford. Would you believe it? He actually believes that Jesus turned water into wine and that he rose from the dead. Could you credit it? So I said, stop right there. I said, Richard, if Jesus is who the New Testament claims he is, the, the Word of God who created the universe, he'd already created water, so perhaps turning it into wine wasn't such a big deal. <laughs> but secondly, and more seriously, I could go through what Jesus did to the resurrection all night, and you wouldn't listen. For the simple reason that you a priori reject the supernatural and you feel with David Hume that miracles of the type found in the New Testament are violations of the laws of nature. So no matter what I say, you won't accept it. So we need to talk about this, so let's do that. Now I said the first thing to realize is that Hume was wrong. I got to know Anthony Flew, the world expert of David Hume, shortly before he died. He used to write as the world's number one atheist, professor of philosophy of Reading in the United Kingdom. And I said to him, Anthony, what do you think now about these arguments? He said, Hume was wrong, I wish I could rewrite my books. Of course, Hume, and I didn't go into this, you could talk to your philosophy teachers about it, but I need to come to the heart of it. Hume did actually had difficulties with the uniformity of nature, so he would have a difficulty formulating a law of nature. But let me leave that aside. This notion that miracles violate the laws needs a bit of investigation. And to cut a long story short, let me give you a little illustration with the, that C.S. Lewis helped me with enormously. I'm staying in a hotel tonight, so imagine I put a thousand grand into the drawer by my bed. And I do the same tomorrow night. So one plus one equals two, so I've got 2,000 grand in my drawer. And I wake up in the morning and I find 500 grand in the bedside drawer. What do I conclude? That the laws of arithmetic have been broken or the laws of South Africa? <laughs> well, you've got the point, haven't you? But half a minute. 
This is very instructive. You've now seen that the word law has two different meanings. And that's part of the confusion. Secondly, how do you know that the laws of South Africa have been broken? It's because you know the laws of Britain. Hume's notion, Dawkins' notion, that the people at the time of the New Testament were primitive and ignorant and didn't know the laws of nature, and therefore they could believe in these miracles, is self-contradictory nonsense. Because you cannot recognize something as an evidence of the supernatural unless you know what normally happens. <coughs> Mary knew exactly where babies come from. Exactly where they come from. <laughs> and when Joseph heard the story, he knew too. <laughs> and when she said, this baby is very special, it's been conceived of the Holy Spirit, he said, well, and he wanted to divorce her. That's not because he was an ignorant peasant. It's because he knew exactly what the law of nature was. And it took a powerful voice from God to get him to change his mind. If you didn't know that dead people normally stay in the grave, <laughs> you wouldn't see anything extraordinary about the resurrection of Jesus. You've got to know they normally stay in the grave. So, it's very silly to say these people were primitive and didn't realize. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, miracles would be a violation of the law of nature if I were claiming as a Christian that Jesus rose from the dead through natural processes, but I'm not claiming that. Christians are claiming that he rose from the dead by an injection of power from outside the world, which is not a closed system. And that is immensely important. You see, one of the corollaries of materialism is that we live in a closed system. The cosmos is a closed system. There is no outside in any sense. But if there is a God who built it and built into it its regularities, he's not a prisoner of them. He can feed in a new event. And the laws of nature take over. So if you did drink too much of the wine that was produced in Kenya, you'll get drunk. It's as simple as that. Now, there's much more to be said. But the point is this, ladies and gentlemen. That objection falls. Science in itself cannot tell you whether or not a miracle occurred. You've got to investigate the evidence for any particular claim in terms of history. Because it's a claim about something unique that happened in the past. And so historical methods are the most appropriate. But now as I conclude, let me come back to this matter of explanation once more. <coughs> because I feel it so important. Science has been very successful. Indeed, reductionistic science has been very successful. But people are beginning to realize there's an increasing problem. And that is the fact that we are in the information age. And we now recognize in engineering and in biology that we're dealing in the cell, for instance, with an unbelievably sophisticated information processor. And at a lower level, when it comes to human DNA, we're dealing with a colossally sophisticated strand that contains information. Now here's the irony of it. Information is not material. Its carriers often are, but information itself isn't, is it? And so the irony to me is science, which being pressurized by the new atheists is trying to reduce everything to a materialistic explanation, suddenly there's an explosion within science that says information may be an irreducible quantity. And indeed there have been several essays published in the last couple of weeks in high-powered magazines on this. Thomas Nagel, a brilliant philosopher of New York, has just written a fascinating book. Its title is immensely provocative, and he's an atheist. Listen to it. Mind and Cosmos. Why the Neo-Darwinian explanation of the world is almost certainly false. 
fascinating. His thesis is that we use the mind to study, but we let the mind out. Now again, it's story time, and I want to finish within a minute, so let me tell you a story rather than philosophize further. We have a wonderful college in Oxford, and we have candlelit dinners at it. I wish I could invite you all. The students could come too. And perhaps some of you will come sometime as students. You'd be very welcome. There are many South Africans with us. But we sit as fellows, and we're told we're to sit. So the guests come in, and this night, the guest that was sitting here to me, not my guest, asked me what I did. I just discovered he was a, a world-class biochemist. And I said, I'm a pure mathematician. He said, how very boring. <laughs> so I tried to redeem the situation rather pathetically. I said, well, you know, I tried to make up for the social ineptitude of pure mathematics by being interested in big questions. He said, like what? Well, I said, for instance, like the status of the universe. Is it created or not? The status of human life. Is it made in the image of God or not? And what he said was this, oh dear, it's far worse than I thought. <laughs> he says, listen, I'm an atheist. I'm a reductionist. We've nothing to talk about. And we're going to have a totally miserable evening. And he ended. So, with that as a wonderful start, I said, no, we're going to have a marvelous evening. He said, what? I said, I'm fascinated by reductionism. He said, what are you? I said, I know at least three times. What kind of you? <laughs> well, that was a bit difficult, so being a kind of Irishman, I helped him out. And I explained to him methodological reductionism that I've just explained to you. I said, we can agree with that. Yes, he said, that's what I do. Well, I said, that's a start, isn't it? But I think you're an ontological reductionist. You can reduce everything to physics and chemistry, can't you? That's what you think, isn't it? Absolutely. So I said, let's do an experiment. He said, what, here? Yes, I said, absolutely. This is Oxford, why not? <laughs> so I picked up the menu and I showed it to him. It wasn't very imaginative, but it said roast chicken in English. And um, <laughs> he said, what's the problem with the menu? I said, no problem at all. Just uh, I want to do a little experiment with you. I said, do you see this? R-O-A-S-T. He said, yeah. What's special about that? I said, nothing in particular. But you notice these marks on the page are semiotic. They carry meaning. Yes, he said, I see that. Okay, I said, you're a reductionist. Please explain to me the semiotics of those methods, the way they carry meaning in terms of the physics and chemistry of the paper. There's a little silence, and his wife was beside him, and rather too loudly, she said, get out of that if you can. But to his credit, he didn't try. His answer was stunning. He said, John, I've gone into my lab for 40 years thinking it could be done. And I now realize it can. And I was so shocked. I said, but physics and chemistry have only been going sensibly about 500 years. He said, doesn't matter. You cannot account for it, bottom up, in terms of physics and chemistry. They haven't got the explanatory power. You have to introduce an author, because semiotics, the moment you see something with a semiotic dimension, you infer intelligence in every area. See the ten letters of your name written in the beach at Cape Town, and you immediately infer that there's been an intelligence operation, don't you? And now comes the fun. How is it that we can look at the 3.5 billion letters of the human genome, four letter chemical alphabet, all in the right order? And I asked my colleagues in Oxford to explain to me their origin, and they say chance and necessity. I say, pardon? Do you mean just chance and the laws of nature? Yes, yes, of course. Well, I said, how is it you look at the 10 letters of your own name, and you induct upwards? to attend. There's something very odd going on in here. The longest word we ever discovered sits at the heart of every one of the 10 trillion or 100 trillion cells in your body. It's a word. So let me conclude by putting these two worldviews to you. One of them says, in the beginning was mass energy, the particles, and they somehow formed the universe. They formed planets. They formed Earth. They formed the oceans. 
They form life. They form consciousness. They form you. And they form the idea of God that is there isn't a God. Or, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. All things came to be through him. And without him, nothing came to be that came to be. It's not only as a Christian, ladies and gentlemen, but as a scientist, that that second explanation makes perfect sense to me. Indeed, my biggest objection to atheism is this. It's the fact that I can do science. You say, however is that the case? Well, think about it. My atheist friends tell me that the mind I'm doing science with is the brain. And the brain is the end product of a mind of some kind of concept. Now, let me put it to you crudely. If you thought that the computer you're going to use tonight was the end product of a mind of some kind of process, you wouldn't use it, would you? <laughs> and leading philosophers, and this is the heart of Nagel's argument, are seeing this. They're making the point that atheism doesn't simply banish God, it ultimately banishes meaning, truth, and science. As Nietzsche saw. That's a heavy price to pay, isn't it? And so for that reason, ladies and gentlemen, by far and away overarching all alternatives, as a scientist and a Christian, I submit to you, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth makes the most sensible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. I now invite questions from the floor. Uh, please feel free. There are two roving microphones. Can I just see where they are? Uh, okay, they'll, they'll there. If you want to ask a question, sure. If you want to ask a question, just please put up your hand, and one of the microphones will be taken to you. And then please kindly state your name before you ask the question. Just uh, give one moment, because then I just want to tell you. Now, those that know me know I have an idiosyncratic way of doing. It. Because I know that you're all interested in other people's questions. And what we're going to do is collect a number of questions before we look at any of them. Because what I want to know and what you want to know is what is the spectrum of interest in this room? So state your question briefly. It's got to be in the topic. I'm not here to discuss underwater applied plastic waiting in the South China Sea. <laughs> Don't state a question of 15 subdivisions. The time you take for your question takes away from other people. I'm going to write half a dozen down, and then we look at them all together and we see what the spectrum is. So put up your hand and the mic will find you. Okay, good evening, Professor Lewis. Um, I first want to thank you for a good speech. It was very engaging and stimulated my thought very much. Um, my question is about questions, and as a philosopher I'm sure you can appreciate that. Uh, the question I want to ask is whether these big questions that we are trying to answer here tonight in our science, whether they are well formed. And to use an analogy of a badly formed question, I'm going to use this room as an example. When I ask, where in this room am I? When I exit the door is a well formed question, because I'm not inside it. So in, this, in an analogous way, the question of who created the universe is a mouthful of question because the default position we have is that the universe is created. The question is asked from an extrapolation from the concept of absence, as there is an absence of elephants in this room. So I'm asking you whether or not that extrapolation is correct and whether the questions are well formed. I don't understand what the elephants have to do with the elephants. <laughs> Just repeat the, the main part of the question. It's quite difficult to hear up here. Just repeat the main thrust of the question, please. The main thrust is whether or not the questions such as 
who created the universe, or how was the universe created, whether or not these questions are now formed, or whether they are incorrect extrapolations of concepts which are confined to the universe, the inside of the universe. Okay. Next. Professor Lennox, my name is Stella. I read a couple of years ago about uh, the idea that God is really utterly and completely simple. Have you come across this? And if you have, do you think that that is nonsense? Three. Okay, I've got it now. Why is it bright? 
they're asked, and you've got the idea of the spectrum of, uh, of them. Um, the first question had to do with well-formed questions. Well, as a philosopher, sir, you know there's a great debate about what you mean by well-formed questions and stuff. And I think at the level of the kind of discussion we're having here, uh, the points I want to make is that when we come to posing our questions, it may seem to you that what I've been suggesting tonight, that all of this is generated by the human intellect, but there's another side to it. And one of the things that has to be controlled by questions is this. I believe not only that there's a material universe, but there is a God who reveals himself. Now that's a huge concept. And revelation is not contrary to rationality. That is a very silly view. I don't know anybody who can read the Bible without using their mind, do you? The point is that we have more than one source of information. And I think what you're hinting at, and we can't go into a philosophical seminar about it, what you're hinting at is that if we simply are extrapolating our questions from within the universe, they may not be well formed when you get to God outside the universe, which is the kind of idea that David Hume suggested. Well, yes and no. I think your warning I would take to be very cautious and very careful. But on the other hand, if it is true, that you and I are made in the image of God as rational thinking people, then if God has built something of his image into us, we can understand about God. That is questions that we raise at one level will be well formed when they're projected up to a higher level. Now, of course, that is a very big issue and it's a very important one. But that, for me, is the major control. Of course, we are in danger of anthropomorphism and of false extrapolations. But as we mature, one hopes we can navigate our way through. And in the end, we've got to make our own decisions about these things on the basis of the apparatus that we've developed intellectually to process them. And so, I would take what you're saying to us is to be cautious that you might make false extrapolations. But of course, if I can give an example, it's perhaps not quite what you mean. But very often people think that God, the question about God is not well formed because actually God is simply the projection of your wish for a father in the sky. You see, the Freudian explanation. Well, there's a wonderful book, if you want to know something about that, written by Manfred Lutz. It's called Eine kleine Geschichte des Christen. A brief history, I don't think it's been translated, but you all read German, I expect. Um, <laughs> And what he says is this, and it's very interesting. He says, if there is no God, Freud gives you a brilliant explanation that the question about God is a false extrapolation, if there is no God. But of course he says, if there is a God, Freud's argument gives you an equally brilliant explanation why atheism is the opium of the people, as Cheshwar Miwash, the Nobel laureate for literature in Poland, saw. The argument works both ways. 
And then the bottom line is, as to the real question, whether there is a God or not, Freud, Jung, Frankl, none of them can help you. You have to look elsewhere. And you know, I can't resist telling you this, because Stephen Hawking was asked recently what he thought about religious faith. Well, he said, it's a panacea, it's a crop, a crutch for people who are afraid of the dark. And I was asked to comment on it. What do you think of his atheism? Well, I said, it's a panacea for people afraid of the light. <laughs> Nothing but a statement like that. <laughs> so let's go. God is utterly simple. Well, sir, I take the question. I've tried to understand people that tell me God is simple because he's no moving parts and all this kind of thing. But on any understanding of the word simple, I wouldn't say it was nonsense, but I just don't understand it. The mind of God, whatever that is, that can conceive information, speech, cells, galaxies, universes, seems to me to be an infinitely complex thing. Secondly, the central part of the Christian claim is that God became human, the Word became flesh. And Jesus Christ, God incarnate, was as complex as you and I are. He was God as well. So I find the word simple it doesn't help me, and I notice talking to my atheist friends, it doesn't help them either because they think it's a cop out. But as the philosophers here, you've got many distinguished philosophers I've discovered in this university, and it would be better to listen to them than listen to me babble about it. Um, okay, well, let's move on because we've only got a few minutes. Um, a very interesting question about biology. Uh, if you found contradiction in the biological textbook, it would all fall. What about the Bible? But it doesn't all fall if you find contradiction in the biology textbooks. That's the interesting thing. That science doesn't immediately collapse what somebody finds a contradiction. If you read, for instance, James Shapiro's book on evolution, a 21st century viewpoint has just come out. He raises all kinds of deep questions about natural selection. Now, if he's right, a great deal falls, but it's not going to just fall like that. Because science has a wonderful capacity to cope with apparent self-contradiction. And paradigm shifts only occur when there's a colossal weight of evidence in the other direction. And so I wouldn't agree with you, say, first of all, about the biology textbooks, and you know what I'm going to say about the Bible. The trouble is that we need to be modest about these things. And if you spend, now this is slightly personal, and it's slightly unfair, uh, speaking for myself, your question is very important to me. Indeed, when I got to Cambridge, let me tell you a bit of my bio so you understand where I'm coming from. I should have told you this before. First week in Cambridge, I was asked by a student, rather too loudly for my life, across the dinner table, do you believe in God? And then he said, oh, sorry, you're Irish, I forgot. Um, <laughs> sorry, I should never ask that question. All you Irish believe in God, you fight about it. <laughs> Some of you do, and ask. I've heard the question before, but that sent me on a life quest. That was a turning point. That was, I know, deliberately set out to interact with people who did not share my worldview. That's what took me to Eastern Europe, 26 years of constant travel, then to Russia after the war fell, to debate these things with people in the Academy of Sciences. And what I discovered is that by exposing my faith in God and the Bible to its opposite, helped me to iron out many of the apparent self-contradictions. And you see, it's a bit like this. Let me put it another way. I've been married for 44 years to the same girl, who I met in day one at university when she was 16, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> now, if suddenly I got a report that she'd been seen with another man in rather curious circumstances, I would say, oh, how can you say? I wouldn't believe it. Not initially. Because I have built up the cumulative evidence of 44 years and seen her trust and loyalty in me and I've saved my life on me. 
You don't just, and it's exactly the same. When you did the scripture for even more than that time in my case, of course there are questions that come up. But they often get resolved. For instance, it used to be thought that the historian Luke was not a very good historian because he thought various names of city officials incorrect. And somebody picks up a, a rock and on it there's the inscription with a proper name. He said, oh, Luke got it right. So there are two things here. One is to be open to the questions. But in your biology, nobody is going to give up. Let me just quote William Profile. A leading American evolutionist has just changed the preface of his book and he says, to my utter astonishment, he, in the following sentence, natural selection does nothing. <laughs> now, I haven't seen the whole world of biologists close their books and throw them away because he's written that. Do you see what I mean? It's a bigger question, but it's an important question. Keep asking your questions. But give both your biology and your Christianity the benefit of the doubt. Because many things, we're not even in a position to resolve them because we simply don't know enough. And we have to be open about it. Right, um, that was that. Water into wine, an open system. To what extent would a Christian God uh, exercise control? Well, that is a question, if I understand the background to it, that philosophers have asked for centuries. It really is the very big question about divine sovereignty and human freedom. And I can't answer that question in, in a few seconds. And you discover, you see, ladies and gentlemen, that Q&A is simply that. All I can do is suggest ways into it. It's an important question. I think, myself, that the thing we find difficult to imagine is God has made us in his image. And God has given us that precious gift of the capacity to trust, which makes us human. You see, if this were a deterministic universe, if we don't sit in love, I wouldn't be interested in a robotic wife with an iPad on her front that says, kiss, press, button, B. <laughs> and nor would you. And what we find it so difficult to get around is a couple of things. God's relationship to time. His knowledge relationship to time. But starting the other way around, one of the things that weighs heavily with me is that at the heart of the Christian challenge is that God has become human and incarnate in Jesus in such a way that people could approach him and talk to him. And it says that to as many as received him, he gave the power to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Those words are meaningless if we go to that capacity. So I'm answering your question obliquely. It deserves a lot more discussion. The Gospel of John, one of the most philosophically rich books of the New Testament, has masses of discussion about it because it's so important. Look at John and the way in which he defines faith, that response to God that capacity that we use in everyday life in all kinds of directions of which we challenge to place in God. So I would say whatever the answer to the question is, God's control does not mean that love is meaningless, that our choices are meaningless, that our lives are meaningless. And there's a very simple evidence of that, isn't there? God is eventually going to judge us according to Scripture for not believing the universe would collapse into non-morality if that had not been possible. God will never condemn anybody for not doing what he couldn't do. Well, that's a huge topic. So let me move on to simple things. Um, would rejecting ontological reductionism change the way we do science? To a certain extent. What we must realize, I think, is this. We've been talking and the danger is the impression that whether you're an atheist or a theist affects the whole of science, it doesn't actually. Because so much of science is dealing with the how question, not origin questions. And if an atheist is studying mathematics and a theist is studying mathematics, chemistry, biochemistry, physics, and so on, 
using the same tools, they're coming to the same conclusions. The differences appear only in a very small percentage of the whole. So we must not lose our sense of proportion. But that percentage is very important. And I come back immediately to this. I think we're going to be forced, let me risk this statement, forced to recognize that information is not reducible to physics and chemistry. And the therefore, inputs of information into the system. I actually ran this question past my colleagues at Oxford recently. I belong to a professor's forum. It's a real mixed bunch of people, mostly natural scientists, philosophers, and so on. And I said, this is legitimate, ladies and gentlemen, to ask the following question as a scientist. Could you think that it's scientifically valid to ask that if you've got a system, a black box here, that it's scientifically valid to ask for scientific evidence that that black box has had an informational input from outside. And everybody agree? Well, I said, what's your difficulty then with God and the universe? You see, in every other area, we admit intelligence. And you've seen that. Archaeology, we do it all the time. Is this stone found in the valley near here? Uh, a windswept uh, stone? Or is it an artifact? And we've got criteria to do it. But we've now got criteria that recognize when a thing has a semantic and a semiotic dimension and when it hasn't. There's a difference between a random string of symbols and the DNA code. We recognize that difference, but it's an informational difference. Now, I'm well aware that quantifying and describing and capturing information philosophically and mathematically is very difficult. But what I would suggest to you is it would change certain aspects of science. And that is what Thomas Nagel, a leading philosopher and an atheist, is saying in his book. He said, we have not listened as an intellectual community to people who are raising the God question, not in the name of a religious book, but in the name of science. In other words, say, in the science court, is there evidence in this universe that it bears the imprimatur of a designing intelligence. And he said, we should listen. Because this is going to be one of the key things. Because our reductionism is not going to be with a phenomenon of mind. And therefore, naturalism is in serious danger of a total collapse. It's very interesting and heavy stuff. And it's only been out a couple of months. And now I come to the last question. No, the second last, but the second last will be very brief. Why is it that atheists get away with calling themselves rights? They don't. Many of my atheist friends think this is utterly absurd, and indeed Christopher Hitchens, bless him, distanced himself from the others who call themselves the brights. They do dare, comes from the Enlightenment, you see. Um, and I suppose I'm one of the dims. And then they thought that the better answer that word, people who believe in the supernatural should be called the supers. <laughs> well, it's absolute childish nonsense. But it's sad. It's just sad to me that people with any scholarly pretension would descend to this kind of triviality. I'm a bright. And they have a whole website and all this kind of thing. What I find is, ladies and gentlemen, the new atheists, part of this title of today, are very much to be distinguished from the many of my friends are atheists, who will say, don't mix me up with them, because the new atheists are militant. Dawkins says, I'm not recommending to you atheism, but militant atheism. And I fear they disqualify themselves from being regarded as intellectual by that kind of triviality. They get away with it, but some people love it. Final question. I've given an argument today that would indicate that there would be an intelligent uh, deity behind, but clearly I'm a Christian. I've claimed to be one. How do you make a step? Now, that question is very perceptive and very important because you're perfectly right. It is not a logical corollary of my arguments from science, the history of science and philosophy, that you get to Christianity. 
So how do you make the step is what you've asked. And in a sense, because I'm a Christian, it's a personal question. So if the pastor likes to listen to me and the rest of you close your ears, I'll go ahead. How do I make that extra step? Well, I only know of one way. The same way as I made the first steps. That is on the basis of evidence. Now, we haven't discussed this tonight, but I discuss it in my books, and you can see it in many of the things on my website, johnlennox.org. That faith, in the sense of the New Testament, is not believing where there's no evidence. It's believing where there is evidence. And it's exactly the same as the faith you have in your friends and the faith you have in the rational intelligibility of the universe on the basis of which you do science. The new atheists have redefined faith and they've caused enormous confusion. So, based on what evidence? Well, of course, Christianity claims to be geared in to history. And so there are now two things, one objective, one subjective, using those words rather loosely. There's the historical evidence. And I'm convinced on the basis of history, and I argue it in my last book, uh, Gunning for God, looking it through the eyes of David Hume, incidentally. Look at the evidence for the historical resurrection of Jesus. And so, coming to the conclusion that there is very powerful historical evidence that Jesus rose from the dead, I'm predisposed to take his views and what he says extremely seriously. I believe, but it's at the end of a lengthy argument, I believe this is evidence that he is who he claimed to be, God incarnate. But then, there's another step. Because you see, let me put it this way, God is not a theory, he's a person. And evidence for persons doesn't stop at evidence for their existence. I am not, let me tell you straight, simply interested in the existence of my wife. <laughs> and proofs for her existence. Cosmological proofs, ontological proofs that Sally exists. No. I'm interested in knowing her. And if God is real and a person, then that raises the possibility that you can get to know him. Now, you would never get to know me, even if you put me under a scanning, tumbling microscope and investigated all my brain waves, you never get to know me unless I reveal myself to you. If Jesus rose from the dead, then the credibility level increases that he is God incarnate, God revealed to us. And then we can make an experiment. We can start to reveal ourselves to him. And he claims that if we trust him, and repent of the mess we've made of our lives. He will give us a new life and give us forgiveness and peace from God. The only way to test that is to give up your distance and make that experiment. Ladies and gentlemen, I could say to you there's a red Ferrari sitting at the front door waiting for you to take for a drive. We could argue philosophically about whether it was there or not for years. There's a better suggestion. Go and look. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll ask another two or three minutes of your time, please. Um, I would now like to conclude this evening by requesting Professor Mariette Lois, the Vice Director of Teaching and Learning on the Potsdam Campus of Northwest University, to address Professor Lennox. Professor Lois, please.
solid and a person of your caliber, Mr. Lina.